Hey friends, today we're going to talk about how we can draw representations of the structures of molecules. So stick around. It's one thing for us to have a, a formula for a compound. It's useful for us to know how many atoms are in the compound and so forth. But it's another thing entirely to be able to say what kind of shape it is, to know how those atoms are arranged in the molecule. That's where structural formulas come into play. A structural formula is basically using letter symbols and bonds to show the relative positions of the atoms in that molecule. There are different types of structural formulas. Here's one type. This is called a ball and stick model. This is the molecule ethanol. You can see the relative arrangement of how the atoms are bonded to one another. Ball and stick models are really great, but sometimes we don't have access to chemical tinker toys, do we? But there is a way we can express how these atoms are bonded together in a molecule. We can use Lewis structures. Remember that we used some very simple Lewis structures earlier in our discussion of chapter 8. A Lewis structure will use electron dot structures of the atoms to represent how those atoms are linked together in a molecule. So let's try a couple of examples. Maybe that will help. Let's use this molecule, phosphorus trihydride, as an example for us. We'll start by determining the positioning of each atom. Really, the main question we're talking about in terms of position is, which one's going to be the central atom? There are a few methods to determine which element in a compound is going to be the central atom. For one, we can compare electronegativity. Usually speaking, the element in a compound with the lowest electronegativity is going to be the central atom. The exception to this is hydrogen. I should tell you that hydrogen is never going to be a central atom. It's always going to be what we call a terminal atom on the outside. It can only bond once. Another method is just to find the least numerous element. In a situation like this, it's pretty easy to see. Phosphorus is the least numerous element, and we'd be correct in saying that phosphorus is the central atom for this molecule. We've also already said that hydrogen can only be a terminal atom, that it's never a central atom. The third method is to memorize a list. It's a list of central priority, if you will. In other words, whichever atom is closer to the top, that atom is most likely to be the central atom. The list goes like this. Carbon, silicon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, then oxygen. Now, if you're wondering, look on the periodic table, and those elements are all right next to each other. So if you have a compound that contains one or more of these elements, the one that occurs first on the list, that one's going to be the central atom. But for the most part, method two works really well for us. That is, finding the least numerous element. The least numerous element is phosphorus. And so that means I'm going to put my phosphorus in the middle, and I'm just going to put hydrogens around it, like so. Next, we have to determine how many electrons are available for bonding. The way that we do this is we calculate all the valence electrons available to us. Phosphorus is in group 15, so therefore it has five valence electrons. Hydrogen is group 1. It has one valence electron for each hydrogen, but there's three of them, right? So that means we have three electrons coming from the hydrogens. We add those up, 5 and 3, and that gives us a total of 8. That means then in our Lewis structure, we'll need to represent eight electrons. The easiest thing to do to start is to place a bonding pair, remember we can use a dash to represent a bonding pair of electrons, between the central atom and each of the terminal atoms. So I've done that here. So how many have we used so far? Two, four, six, right? We have a total of eight, so that means we need to use two more. Once you've used your bonding pairs, then use the rest of the electrons as lone pairs paying close attention to the octet rule, especially for that central atom. So since hydrogen can only bond one time, and hydrogen can only accommodate two electrons, each of these hydrogens is fulfilled. And now we see that phosphorus has two, four, six, eight electrons surrounding it, which means that the octet rule is fulfilled for phosphorus. So this is our Lewis structure for phosphorus trihydride. Let's do another one. CCl4, carbon tetra chloride, right? Carbon tetrachloride. So let's use our rules and determine how to write the Lewis structure for this molecule. First, we need to decide what the central atom is going to be. Based on the methods we've already discussed, which one do you think is the central atom? 
That's right, carbon. Not only is it the least numerous, but it's also at the top of our list. Remember the list of priority? So carbon is our central atom. I'll then position the other chlorines around the carbon. Now we need to determine how many valence electrons we have at our disposal. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. It's in group 14, right? How many does chlorine have? It's in group 17 and it has seven valence electrons. There are four chlorines. Four times seven gives us 28. That means we'll have a total of 32 valence electrons to work with when we're writing our Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride. So here we go. Let's start by adding the bonding pairs. And right away we can see that carbon is fulfilling the octet rule, isn't it? Two, four, six, eight. So we've only used eight electrons at this point out of 32. That means we have how many left? 24. So what we do next is we're going to use these electrons and add lone pairs or unbonded pairs to the rest of the atoms. So this chlorine has three unbonded pairs and by giving it three unbonded pairs we've now given chlorine a total of eight. Two, four, six, eight. So chlorine has fulfilled the octet rule. Let's do that with the other three. Okay, as you can see, I've added unbonded pairs to the other chlorines, just like I did for the first one. And we can see now that each of these chlorines fulfills the octet rule. Each of them has access to eight electrons now. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. And when we count all the electrons represented here, we get 32. So this is our correct Lewis structure for carbon tetrachloride. Let's try one now where it's not so simple to determine which atom is the central atom. We've got hydrogen cyanide. The CN ion is the cyanide ion. We also call this hydrocyanic acid. Yes, yes, I know. There are more than two atoms there. This is one of those exceptions to the rule. The cyanide ion, since it doesn't have oxygen involved in it, is allowed to use the rules for binary acids. So this is called hydrocyanic acid. Anyway, let's go ahead and try to figure out which one of these is the central atom. Since there's equal amounts of each one, we can't use the method that says use the least numerous one. So we have to use our list. And look who's here. It's the king of the list himself, carbon. Carbon is our central atom in this case. So I simply place carbon in the center and then I place the other two atoms on the outside. Now let's determine how many electrons we have at our disposal. Hydrogen has one valence electron, carbon has four valence electrons, and nitrogen has five. For a grand total of 10 electrons. So we need to be able to represent 10 electrons when it's all said and done. Let's start by adding bonding pairs like so. We've bonded everything that we can bond, and we still have only used four electrons, right? Two, four. So what do we do now? Let's see what happens when we use the rest as lone pairs, like we did with the previous one. So now each atom that can hold eight has eight. Hydrogen, of course, can only hold two, but the carbon has two, four, six, eight around it, and the nitrogen has two, four, six, eight around it. However, there's a problem. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. That's way too many. We don't have 14 electrons at our disposal. So let's try another way. Let's come back to this point and see if we can add more bonds, more bonding pairs, if that will help. So I'll add another bonding pair here. I can't add one over here because hydrogen can only bond once. But carbon still only has a total of six electrons. So it's not quite fulfilling the octet rule. So let me add another bond. Okay, so now I've used eight electrons. Carbon has the octet rule completely fulfilled. And now all we have to do is make sure that nitrogen does the same. Right now, nitrogen has access to six, two, four, six. So all we have to do is put the two remaining electrons on nitrogen, like so. And this is the correct Lewis structure for HCN. Let's say you get to this point and you're not sure how far back to go to fix things. Here's something you can do. If you have too many electrons listed, then take one of these lone pairs and convert them into a bonding pair. 
making sure not to put it over here since hydrogen can't bond more than once. So I'll take this pair right here and turn it into a bonding pair. But I have to be careful and keep track of my octets. Carbon has an octet, has eight electrons, but now nitrogen has too many. So I need to take some away from nitrogen as well to make that even. So I recount my electrons and I find that I have 12. Still too many. So I'll do the same thing. I'll turn one of these unbonded pairs into a bonding pair. I'll check my octets, make adjustments as I need to, and now I have my correct Lewis structure. We can even use this process to determine the structure of polyatomic ions, like the phosphate ion. First of all, our central atom is phosphorus. It's the least numerous, and it actually comes on the list of priorities before oxygen does. Now let's figure out how many electrons I have at my disposal. Phosphorus has a total of five valence electrons. Each oxygen has a total of six valence electrons, but there's four of them. Six times four gives us 24. But we also have three additional electrons at our disposal. This ion group has taken on three electrons so that it can have this negative three charge. So I have to add another three electrons to my total. Five and 24 and three gives me a total of 32 electrons. So now let's start by adding our bonding pairs. Now we've used two, four, six, eight of our total electrons. 32 minus eight gives us 24. Let's use the rest as non-bonding pairs on the atoms that haven't fulfilled the octet yet. And there we go. Now each of the oxygens has an octet Phosphorus has an octet, and we have a total of 32 electrons listed here. One more thing that we do, we signify that this is an ion group by using brackets, like so. And we'll put the negative three charge on the outside of those brackets. The reason is that we have to think of this as a team, and the entire team gets the three electrons. Those three electrons don't belong to any particular atom in this team. They belong to the entire team. Let's take a look at the nitrate ion. NO3 it has a negative one charge. Nitrogen is the central atom here. It is the least numerous, and it's also higher on our list of priority than oxygen is. So I've gone ahead and set up my molecule like so. Now let's figure out how many electrons we have available. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Each oxygen has six. Multiplied by three gives us 18. And then we have this negative one charge. Remember, that means that that belongs to the whole team, that negative one charge. So there's one extra electron that's been added to the team. So I'll add one more electron. So if this was a negative two or a negative three, I would add that many more electrons. And by the way, if this were a positive charge, I would subtract from my total electrons in that case. You get it? Okay. Anyway, five and 18 and one give me 24 total electrons. So I should be able to represent 24 electrons in my final Lewis structure. We'll start with bonding pairs as shown, and now I'll put some non-bonding pairs to fulfill the octets on each of the atoms. So now we have octets on each of the atoms, but when I count up all my electrons, I find that I have too many. There are 26 on the board. I only have 24 to offer. As we saw before, that means I need to increase my bonding electrons. So what I'll do is I'll take two away from the nitrogen and place them here, and I'll correct my octets as needed. So now we have eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, eight around this oxygen, and eight around this nitrogen, giving me octets for everyone and a total of 24 electrons. I'll show that it's an ion group by adding my brackets and the negative symbol outside the bracket. But there's one more thing to note about this situation. I could just as easily have put the double bond here or the double bond here. Let me draw those two structures in addition to this one. So you could see that I could have drawn this three different ways. Whenever you have a situation in which more than one valid Lewis structure can be drawn for the same molecule, that's what we call resonance. When we have resonance structures, notice that the only thing that changes are the positioning of the electron pairs not the atoms. The atoms stay the same, it's just how the electrons are positioned. We put the arrows here to show that the real structure of the nitrate ion is kind of an average of all three of these. 
And in actuality, that is indeed the case. Remember how we said that double bonds are shorter than single bonds? Well, the interesting thing about the nitrate ion is, experimentally, we can find that all three of the nitrogen-oxygen bonds are the same length. Now remember, if one of them was a double bond, that bond would be shorter than the rest. In fact, we see that all three of the nitrogen-oxygen bonds are shorter than single bonds, but longer than double bonds. Another way you'll see this drawn is like this, showing that the electrons are very evenly distributed around the nitrate group. So remember, whenever we have more than one valid Lewis structure for the same molecule or ion, that is a resonance situation. Let's talk about a few exceptions to the octet rule. And we will come across examples like this, so it's good for us to see them now. Sometimes we'll encounter a molecule like nitrogen dioxide that gives us an odd number of electrons. Notice that we have a total of 17 electrons available to us. That means that somebody's gonna be unhappy in terms of an octet. In this case, it's nitrogen. While this oxygen has eight, this oxygen has eight, nitrogen only has seven. But this is the way it has to be in this case because we have an odd number of electrons. So that's one example of an exception to the octet rule. Another exception occurs when we have what we call a sub-octet. In the case of boron trihydride, the maximum amount of electrons we can have is six. Three from the boron and three from the three combined hydrogens. So in our molecule, all we can represent are six electrons. That's fine for the hydrogens, they each get two, but the boron will only have six, less than the desired octet. Because of that, boron trihydride tends to be rather reactive and boron then will try to share an entire pair of electrons with another atom in order to have that stable octet. For example, the boron trihydride may react very readily with something like ammonia. Since the nitrogen has an unshared pair of electrons available, the boron will share those electrons with the nitrogen, and in doing so, boron now has access to eight, and nitrogen has access to eight. In a situation like this, we call this a coordinate covalent bond, in which one atom is responsible for both of the electrons in the shared pair. So atoms that have lone pairs, like nitrogen, often form coordinate covalent bonds with atoms that need two or more electrons. Another type of compound that doesn't follow the octet rule are compounds that have central atoms that have an expanded octet. In other words, they have greater than eight valence electrons, such as the case with phosphorus pentachloride, which has a total of 40 valence electrons available to it. When we arrange the Lewis structure, we find that phosphorus has a total of 10 valence electrons surrounding it. Now, the reason for this is because phosphorus and other elements that are period three or greater have the ability to utilize their d orbitals in addition to their s and p orbitals as well. So ones like phosphorus have the capacity for moving more than eight electrons into their orbitals. Again, this is known as an expanded octet. One more concept we want to talk about is that of formal charge. Formal charge helps us to better understand how those electrons are likely to be distributed around that molecule. We determine the formal charge for each atom in the molecule, and this is how we do it. Formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons of that atom. We subtract the amount of non-bonded electrons on that atom, and we also subtract half of the bonded electrons on that atom. It's also important to note that we have better stability in our molecule if the formal charges of the atoms are as close to zero as possible. Let's say we're trying to decide between the more valid Lewis structure of SO3, sulfur trioxide. We have a total of 24 electrons, and I've drawn it two different ways, representing 24 electrons in each one. We can use formal charge to decide which of these two is the more valid Lewis structure. Let's start with the first Lewis structure we see that the formal charge for sulfur is six valence electrons minus zero unbonded electrons, notice that there are no lone pairs, minus half of the six bonding electrons that we see around sulfur. Six minus zero minus three gives us positive three. That means that sulfur has a positive three charge in this molecule. Each oxygen has six valence electrons, minus six non-bonded electrons, minus half of two bonded electrons, giving it a formal charge of negative one. So each oxygen has a negative one formal charge. 
notice that all the charges combined equal zero. That's the way it should be since sulfur trioxide has no charge. But let's compare that to the other Lewis structure. In the second Lewis structure, we see that the formal charge of sulfur is six, six valence electrons, minus zero unbonded electrons, minus half of 12, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 electrons around the sulfur. Remember that sulfur does have a D sublevel, so it can hold more than eight electrons. Six minus zero minus six gives us a formal charge of zero. Since all three of the oxygens are in the same situation, we can calculate the formal charge of one of them and it will be the same. Six valence electrons minus four unbonded electrons minus half of the bonded electrons, that would be four as well, two, four. Six minus four minus two gives us zero. So each of the oxygens in this Lewis structure has a formal charge of zero. All the charges combined give us zero, which agrees with the overall charge of sulfur trioxide. So comparing the two, we see that this situation has formal charges that are close to zero. In fact, they're all zero, aren't they? In contrast to this situation, in which we have formal charges that are further away from zero. So because of that, this is the better Lewis structure for us. So that's another way you can figure out whether your Lewis structure is valid. Okay, I have an assignment for you. I have two compounds, and I'd like for you to draw the Lewis structures of each one. The first one is carbon tetrabromide. The second one is xenon tetrafluoride. Now I'm going to give you a hint on the second one. The second one has an expanded octet. And remember, you can always put any unused electrons on your central atom. So on paper, draw a Lewis structure for those two molecules, take a picture of it, and submit it to the LMS. That's all we're going to do for this video. Today we talked about the steps that are involved in drawing a valid Lewis structure. We also talked about concepts such as resonance, in which you can have more than one valid Lewis structure for a particular molecule. We talked about exceptions to the octet rule, such as a sub-octet, an expanded octet, or even an odd number of electrons. And finally, we talked about the concept of formal charge. I hope this has been a helpful video for you. If I can assist you in any other way, please let me know. Until next time, God bless.